Okay, good morning, let's start. Um, let's see, so uh, today I'll have office hours from 3.30 till 5, and in general office hours will be Wednesdays, 3.30 till 5. Uh, I, I've just sent out a mail about that. Um, and uh, today we're carrying on with Russell's thing on descriptions, and then on Friday we move into the modern world with Kripke's naming and necessity. Uh, I guess naming a necessity is the most, is that right? It's, a, it's the single most influential book in the last 50 years in the philosophy, is that? I mean, I know they call it the Purple Bible. The Purple Bible, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, it's very highly thought of. Okay, uh, let's leave it at that. And um, uh, So on Friday, your ta for Friday, your task is to do the reading from Kripke in the reader. Um, and we'll spend three sessions on that material. But for Friday, if you could specially try and focus on the parts where Kripke is talking about rigid designation, that's the topic I'll focus on on Friday. OK, are you guys all doing the reading? I mean, have you all read the Russell, read the Frege, read the Sir? OK, very good. Um, OK, so I'll start off by just going back over or what I said about descriptions last time, um, and then uh, look at what Russell says then about names and how we understand names properly so-called. So the analysis of the F is G, the King of France is bold, is there is a King of France, and most one thing of King of France, and anything that is a King of France is bold. So although it looks like definite descriptions refer, they don't really, right? That was the, the stunning climax of last time's lecture, right? And it really is an important point uh, that if you see Frege and um, Searle, they're, they're just taking it for granted that descriptions refer. A way to think of it is this. Suppose you've got a predicate like is tall. A predicate like is tall, that's a general term that it can apply to lots of people, right? Lots of different people can be tall. It's not, there isn't just one person that can be tall. So there's a kind of slot here where you can put a name of the particular person you want to say to be tall. Yes? You can say Tom is tall, Sally is tall, Hanyu is tall. OK, is there anything else that can hit that slot? Than a name. Yes, what? An object. Uh, well, if you, <laughs> if you actually put, an, like, a, here I have a simple object, right? If I put an object there, it's, it doesn't really work, right? Uh, a name of an object, yes. The object itself, maybe not so much. Yeah. OK. Uh, no, that's, that's worth trying, but, but, but I, I don't think you can be right. Yeah. A description. Very good. Yes, OK. You could put a description in there. Anything else? Yep. Tall is tall. You could, but I, um, what would it mean? Uh, I mean, tall, people can be tall, but tall is like, um, what is tall anyway? Is that property? The property of being tall is tall? Yeah, right. <laughs> there speaks a true metaphysician, right? Um, you could do that, but it would be highly non-standard, right? I, I promise you the average person around campus, if you said that kind of thing to them, would say, you're doing philosophy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not regular. OK, uh, yes? You could put a quantifier. A quantifier, very good. What about <laughs> that was the preferred answer, yeah? So if I put... Someone is tall in there. That makes perfect sense, right? Yes? Um, and there, so is someone the name of a person? No, someone is not the name of, of a person. Someone, I'm just telling you how many things meet that predicate. I'm not specifying which one. Yep. Um, and if I say everyone is tall or no one is tall, I'm telling you something about how many people hit that spot? All, none, some, yeah? Um, now, the, 
so there are two different kinds of things that can hit the spot with a predicate. One is a quantifier, the other is a name. That's all right. A quantifier doesn't tell you who it is that satisfies the predicate. They just tell you how many. Yeah? That's all right. OK, so a way to look at Russell's analysis is that he's saying that the is a kind of quantifier. It's a pretty fancy quantifier. It says, um, if you say VF is G, you've got a quantifier here that says something like the, un the X the, such that X is uniquely F is G. Now, that's just a how many term. It tells you there's a unique X, which is F. Yeah, that doesn't tell you which one. It just says there's exactly one, one, yeah? A unique one, this F, and it's G. That should be kind of obvious at this point. If it's not kind of obvious, just put up your hand if that's kind of obvious at this point. Okay, and if it's not kind of obvious, and if you, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, hello? <laughs> you can't abstain. That's all the options. <laughs> Let's do that again. Is that kind of obvious? Is that not obvious? OK. Um, if I take um, someone or no one, right? I can say someone or no, someone is F. I can say someone is G, right? Suppose I say someone is G. Yeah. I haven't referred to anyone there. If I say um, at most one thing is G, I haven't referred to anyone there. Yeah. I've just, got, I've just said, how many? And so what I've done here is I've said, there's a unique x, which is f. There's just one x, which is f. I haven't named it. And I said, that unique thing, which is f, is g. So this is just another quantifier. It's, kind of, it's what um, is sometimes called a restrictive quantifier, because it says, uh, uh, there's a unique f. There's just one f, and it's g. Yep. So descriptions are not like names. So if you say, the golden mountain does not exist, to take that from last time. That's kind of ambiguous. What you mean to be saying is, it's not true that there's a unique um, uh, golden mountain um, which exists. Yeah? But there's a reading in which this is false. The golden mountain does not exist. I mean, it's a little bit weird. You can hear that kind of, if you say, um, I'll tell you something that doesn't exist. The golden mountain doesn't exist. Well, in using the phrase the golden mountain, you seem to be asserting that there is a unique thing, which is the golden mountain. But how could that be if it doesn't exist? You see what I mean? Let's do that again. The golden mountain, when I say the golden mountain, I'm saying there's a unique uh, x, which is the golden mountain. So that requires that the thing exists. But then I'm going to say that it does not exist. So I say the gold mountain does not exist. Is that a contradiction, or does that make perfect sense? Sorry? <laughs> Don't lose your nerve here. <laughs> it's a contradiction, yes. Uh, that, that's right. There is a reading on which it's a contradiction. That's this reading. On this reading, it says there's a unique thing, which is the golden mountain, and that thing does not exist. That just is a contradiction. That makes no sense. Yeah? But there's another reading on which you're saying, consider the remark, the golden mountain exists. That's not true. There you hit the jackpot, yeah, because there is no golden mountain. Yeah, that's this one. It's not the case that there's a unique X, which is the golden mountain, and X exists. So you have the knot right in the outside, as opposed to having the knot tucked away inside. Yeah. OK, so that was one benefit of talking uh, of Russell's analysis of descriptions. It explains how descriptions can have meaning even if they don't refer. It explains how you can meaningfully and truly say that uh, the F does not exist. Yeah, that was one of Frege's basic reasons for introducing the notion of sense, to explain how a sign can have meaning without referring to anything. But here, we're explaining how descriptions can have meaning without supposing that they refer at all. They never refer, but they do have meaning, even when they don't have a denotation, 
even when there's no thing that um, uh, there's no unique thing of the kind they're specifying. Frege's other puzzle was informative identities. Um, so one way to put it is to say you can wonder whether the morning star is the evening star. It's not kind of obvious that the morning star is the evening star. But if you analyze these as descriptions, what you're saying is, I wonder whether the unique x, such that x is the brightest star seen in the morning, and the unique y, such that y is the brightest star seen in the evening, are such that x is identical to y. No referring terms there, but you explained how you can be doing that wondering without appealing to sense. Yeah. Isn't that great? If you've got Russell's theory of descriptions, you can explain how there can be meaning without anything being uniquely singled out, and how there can be meaning, uh, how there can be informative identities involving descriptions. Bingo. And did we use the notion of sense? Did we use that difficult notion of your take on the object? Put up your hand if you think we just used the notion of sense. And if you think we did not use the notion of sense, and if you think that's just grit, <laughs> very good. <laughs> that's certainly what Russell thought. That's just fantastic, right? Um, we have done it. We, d we didn't need that obscure notion. So let me just finally go back over this thing about the optical illusion of reference. Um, suppose you take a remark like the author of Waverley was Scotch. Then if that's going to be true, there's got to be exactly one person who wrote Waverley. Right? That's what Russell's analysis says. So suppose there is exactly one person who wrote Waverley. Call that the denotation of the description. Whenever you've got a description that actually is uniquely singling out something, there's going to be the object, and you can call that the denotation. Right? The author of Waverley, the um, tallest person in the room, the youngest person in the room, whatever. Yeah? There's going to be the denotation of the description. And so when you look at the, uh, the sentence, the author of Waverley was Scotch, whether that whole thing is true will depend on whether the denotation was Scotch. Yeah? That's what makes it look just like reference. You, you see what I mean? It looks like denotation, reference, is just the same thing. Yeah? Because whether the, the whole sentence is true depends on whether the predicate applies to the denotation. But Russell's saying, that is really an illusion. This is not reference proper. Um, consider these three sentences in his analysis. At least one person wrote Waverley, and most one person wrote Waverley. Anyone who wrote Waverley was Scotch. Suppose you're living 200 years from now. And suppose that 200 years from now, um, there are lots of different ways of generating novels. right? So um, sometimes they're generated by machines. Sometimes they're written by committees of people. Um, all kinds of d different things are possible. I mean, the marketing of novels is much slicker then than it is now. Um, and suppose that you are a literary historian. right? You have ways of uh, uh, doing a stylistic analysis of text. And you can say, I can find out how many human writers a novel had. Did it have none? Was it written by a committee? Um, and you can find out the nationalities of the, the, the this, is your, this is your special skill, right? This is what they pay you for at the university. You sit there and you track through these novels from long ago. So you could do that. You could take um, Waverley and track through it stylistically and say, that had at least one author. Yeah? That had at most one author. I know when there are two different hands involved in the construction of a text. And so you just piece this together very slowly, right? It takes you a year to figure out there was at least one human involved here. Then there was at most one human. And any human involved in this was Scotch. You can see that there, <laughs> this was not sullied by any non-Scotch hand. You, you, you see what I mean? You, you could figure that out. You could figure out each of these sentences one by one. You could say, this one's true, tick. That one's true, tick. That one's true, tick, right? At no point did you realize, I'm getting a denotation here. There was a unique thing that wrote Waverley. You just ticked the boxes. So you could understand those three sentences without realizing there was any such thing as a denotation. The existence of the unique human that, was, that, that wrote this. I mean, you might be just logically a bit slow. I mean, you guys are very fast, right? You guys um, see in a 
twinkling of an eye that if these three sentences imply there was a unique author of Waverley. But suppose you're, you're very good at the stylistic analysis, but just a bit slow logically. Then you toil through those three sentences, you tick each of them, but you don't notice that there's, that, that implies there's a unique denotation. So what that means is that you understand each of these three sentences, you understand the full analysis, and whether you even realize that there is such a thing as the denotation of the description is an optional extra. You guys are very fast, you do this kind of automatically, right? You do this quickly, but you don't need to do that. It's an optional extra in your understanding of a sentence involving a description. Whereas, consider the remark, Scott was Scotch. For Scott is the name of the author. Could you understand that without knowing that there was a particular object involved here? Well, not if Scott is a name. Because the only way you have of understanding the name is knowing which object it stands for. I mean, you couldn't understand Scott and say, oh, but I didn't realize there was such a person. You see what I mean? In order to know what a name means, you have to know there was a unique object there. Yep. Like what? Santa Claus? Santa Claus? What are you telling me? <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, yeah. So what's your conclusion if it has meaning but no reference? I, I don't know. I'm like, what would you say about that? Yeah. Um, the really puzzling thing about that is why isn't that a name like Blur? Yeah? Where you just don't know what you're talking about. You know, the, 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 it wouldn't be so devastating if, um, if it didn't have meaning, right? It's not like Blur. Yet to be told that Blur does not exist is not a big deal. Um, but, but Santa Claus does not exist. That can really be something you have trouble with. Yeah. yeah. Um, it really has meaning even if it doesn't refer. So how can that be? Well, the only way we have of understanding that situation so far would be to say that Santa Claus is really a description. It's not really a name. Because a name is something that works like this. It gets a meaning by being tied up to a reference. And um, uh, Frege's way or saying, well, you can have the sense, that stops short of the reference, right? The only way Frege had of explaining to you what sense was, was to give a description, yeah? Um, and Russell is saying, well, that's okay, but descriptions aren't really names. So if Santa Claus has meaning even though it doesn't refer, then it can't be a name. It must be a description. That's what Russell is going to say, yeah? Um, that's all right? Uh, yes? Scott was Scotch, yep. I feel like I can make conclusions from that. I think there's a person named Scott. There's a person Wait, no, no, no. You don't mean there's a person named Scott. Scott, yes. And you would know this person named Scott. And you know. The person named Scott was Scotch. And maybe you were making this up and Scott is an imaginary friend. And it still did actually mean something to you. And I was thinking about when also there's a Scotch or Waverly or something. Yes. Right. Very good. OK, so um, uh, with Scott, if, 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 if Scott is my name for my imaginary friend, yeah, we all have imaginary friends, right? <laughs> right? Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so Scott is my name for my imaginary friend. And uh, uh, Waverly is the imaginary novel that um, Scott wrote, that Scott wrote. Yeah? then um, uh, I can say Scott was Scotch, Scott wrote Waverley. That all makes sense. None of them exist. So those must be descriptions too. Scott must be a description too. Right. Yeah? So, yeah. You bring me on to our next topic, names. <laughs> right. So l l l let's just look at what Russell says about that. What Russell says about that is pretty dramatic. Um, but first of all, um, there must be names. It can't be all descriptions. It can't be all quantifiers. Um, you can't, uh, the, the, well, one way to think of it is, how do you explain the meaning of a predicate? Suppose you and I are looking at the night sky, and I say, that one's bright. 
and you say, uh, wait a minute, I never heard that word before. Right, suppose English is not your native language, you're perfectly intelligent, you understand a lot of English, uh, but um, you just never heard that particular word. How am I going to explain the meaning of bright to you? Can I use a quantifier? I say, look at, uh, look at this dazzling vista. Some star is bright. That's not going to help. If I just say, well, they're all bright, that's not going to help. That's not how you can explain the meaning of a predicate. The way you explain predicates is by saying, look, that one's bright, that one's bright, that one isn't bright, that one isn't bright, that one's bright. You want to explain the meaning of red. You say something like, look, this is red, and that's red, and that's red. That's not red. That's, uh, that's a different color. You, you see what I mean? You name all the things and say um, the predicate applies or doesn't apply. If you were just uh, trying to explain predicates, in terms of quantifiers, well, you'd never get started. Yeah, you'd never understand the language at all. Um, another way to think of it is, if you say someone is F, or there is an X that is F, you can always ask the question, namely, that whenever you've got a quantified sentence, there is always, um, whenever you've got an existentially quantified sentence, whenever you've got a sentence that says something exists, you can always say, well, tell me its name. What's it called? Who is it? If you say um, there's an X that is F, you can say, namely, well, it's A, right? Our old friend A. Yeah? You remember this from logic, right? You had quantifiers, predicates, and last but not least, names. Yeah? If you did this in the logic class, then there's got to be that class of names. So if you've got a quantifier expression that says there's exactly one X which is F, and any Y that is F is also G, well, that's what we're meaning by, by the F is G. So you can always ask when you've got that quantified expression, namely, what's his name, this thing? Give it a tag. It's our old friend A, you might say. Now, there's got to be that class of names that's more basic than quantifiers. So what are they? Well, the two basic problems that we've been looking at so far are informativeness and meaning without reference, right? The possibility of informative identities and of meaning without reference. And as just came up with Santa Claus and um, Scott, uh, uh, if you have the possibility of informative identities or you have meaning without reference, the only way we have of explaining those things is by saying, well, these are descriptions, right? So the only way we have of understanding that is in terms of descriptions. So here's Russell. Um, in the uh, descriptions thing, so long as names are used as names, Scott is Sir Walter is the same trivial proposition as Scott is Scott. This is really a bombshell, what he's saying here. If you think about it, it's telling you such a lot about what names must be. If you get two names, you can't have an informative identity. So Frege's problem just vanishes if it's really two different names of the same thing, not two different descriptions, then you can't have an informative identity. Any two names put together in an identity proposition is going to be trivial. That's what he's saying. OK? So first of all, that's kind of a bombshell. And the other problem, so that's about informative identities. The other problem was meaning without reference. And Russell says, if you could have meaning without reference, then that just shows that what you're dealing with is not a name. It must at best be a description. We may inquire significantly whether Homer existed. Right, it makes sense to say, was there any such person as Homer? Just as people were saying, I can ask, is there any such person as Scott? Or is there any such person as um, <laughs> Santa Claus? Uh, um, then uh, that shows that these are descriptions. Right? So most of what we call names really are descriptions. Yeah? The ordinary proper names. Um, uh, you take any name, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You could ask, but did, did that really exist? Or was this not really some kind of Hollywood um, fantasy, <laughs> was there really such a person? 
Um, you can ask that significantly of just about any name. If you think about Cartesian skepticism, you can suppose that none of these people exist, right? It's all a dream. The names um, would all still have meaning. In those cases, Russell says, where you get informative identities and where you get um, uh, the possibility of meaning without reference, no names in the strict sense occur. You just don't get regular names. Uh, you just don't get names ordinarily. There is no such thing as a class of names. Yep. So what would uh, Russell say if we found out that Shakespeare existed in Marlowe? If Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe. Uh, that, was, that would be highly informative, right? Um, and that would show that Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, neither of them were names. They were really disguised descriptions. Shakespeare means something like the person who wrote all these plays. Marlowe means something like the person who wrote all those plays. And what we've discovered is that the X, which is the unique X that wrote all these plays, and the X, which is the unique X that wrote all those plays, they're one and the same. Yeah, it's a quantified thing. Yep. So things like, uh, I don't know, the you don't really think about things you don't really remember, you're talking about those things. Uh, we, you, well, the, the question who we're talking about, yeah, is we, we, we're talking about the denotations. About is not really a strict term, if you see what I mean. Like in the middle of a philosophical discussion, you might say to me, but look, what are we really talking about here? You see what I mean? You say, well, what we're really talking about is democracy or whatever, right? Um, so uh, when you say who are we talking about, we're using descriptions, but we're using them to talk about the historical people, in your example. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Something like Searle might be right on, on Russell's way of thinking of it here. There are pegs on which we hang descriptions. Yeah. Um, OK. So with the express exception of this and that and a few other words of which the meaning varies on occasion, so what on earth can he be talking about? What are the names? There's got to be names, right? It can't all be quantifiers. But what we ordinarily think of as names have all just <laughs> been shunted off from uh, counting as, or as names because you can have informative identities and because you can have meaning without reference. So what signs are there that where you can't have informative identities involving them and you can't have meaning without reference? Class? This is the problem Russell faced. If you had to, fa if, you, if you could do it, you can do it. Yes? I just wanted to make a sort of idea that we're working on. Yeah, sure, sure. What we were saying was that names are just a short form of a description that you usually pick up from any name. Ordinary names, yeah, what we ordinarily call names like Scott or Homer or Schwarzenegger or, or whatever, these are really just descriptions because for them, informative identities can be stated. And as, as you and another question that earlier said, you can have meaning without reference for them. So what if everyone uh, has this uh, description associated with his name, but everyone's wrong about it? Like, who, who determines what if the description is right or wrong? And it's, it's self-reasonable or right or wrong? Well, um, I guess the idea would be that in the case of Homer, yeah, uh, my impression is that all these books that Homer is meant to have written. What are the books Homer wrote? Uh, the Odyssey, very good, OK. Uh, let, let, let's just call it, call it the Odyssey. Right? Um, and then there's a question. Uh, did some one person write this? I mean, an alternative hypothesis is this was just an oral tradition that went on for centuries, being elaborated by different speakers, right? People just communicated it from generation to generation. Um, people learned these stories off by heart and added their own embellishments and so on. So there was no one author. Yeah? So in this use, Homer means whoever wrote the Odyssey. What if you're wrong about it? What yeah, well, then there's no such person as Homer. If you're wrong about that and there is just the oral tradition, then there's no such person as Homer.
That's right. That's right. Homer is just uh, a shorthand for the um, the author of the Odyssey. But then you can't really be wrong in using the name Homer. But then I feel like you should be able to say, oh, you were wrong. Well, like, Homer is something. You shouldn't be really wrong. I don't know. No, that's very good. Yeah, I, I, I think your ear there is right. Yeah. Um, uh, th th that is one thing that Serle was trying to get allow for with his cluster of descriptions. Yeah, there's a kind of bag of descriptions there, and you might toss out any one of them. Yeah, so I I if that worked, that would get the effect you want. Is, is that right? Because what you've got to tie the way I put it, and the way um, I think Russell tends to put it is, you just get a single description or a couple of descriptions associated with the name. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. That's a really important point you, 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 you're raising. Um, it's, uh, it's quite delicate, though. It's important to get it s stated straight. Yeah. Um, suppose there's a serial killer um, on the loose, right? And we call uh, the, the, the police say, okay, we'll call, we're going to call this guy um, Jack the Strangler. Right, um, and suppose so th th then one way you could throw out the description is if I'm um, if I'm a trainee cop doing my best to you know bright alert go ahead. Um, I say maybe we're making a big mistake here, Commander. Maybe um, these murders were all committed by different people. Right, that's a possible hypothesis. Right, I may get very far there. Right, but. If all we're going on is we've got all these murders, we think there was a serial killer, and we're calling them Jack the Strangler, yeah? then if I'm a bright cop and I say, but commander, commander, maybe someone did, some one person did commit all these murders, but maybe it wasn't Jack. <laughs> right. But it has to be that description in that case, right? I mean, how could it be that someone... Would you, really get, would you really promote me on the basis of this idea? Maybe there is some one serial killer out here, but it's not Jack. It's someone else. How could that be? So you're saying when the smart cops say, oh, Jack did not kill these people, you're saying someone who killed these people did not kill these people. That's, That's right. That's exactly right. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you just introduce Jack by means of the description, the unique serial killer, if there is one. Yeah? Um, and to say there's a unique serial killer, all right, but it's not Jack, you can't do that, right? You can't just toss out the description like that. Yeah? It's as if you said, I was born all right, but it wasn't my mother. No, <laughs> I mean, your, per your mother is just whoever it was that bore you. You, you, you. you see what I mean? You can't toss out the description. The, the, there was somebody else. Has it gone away? Okay. okay. So what, what are the names going to be? Yes? Maybe, maybe if you're pointing to something specific yep. that you can see and then you attribute a name to it. Right. Uh, I'm going to call that Scott. Okay, I'm going to call that Scott. That's Scott. Okay, um, the thing is, with a regular three-dimensional object, there, are, there is always the possibility of different perspectives on one and the same thing. You see what I mean? Um, if I get carried away in philosophical discussion after the class, I fall asleep under the board. I wake up looking at it from an unfamiliar angle. I can say, is that Scott? You see what I mean? That would be informative. That thing is Scott. Yeah. That's the thing about most objects. You can come at them. You see what I mean? It's a 3D object. You can kind of come at it from different vantage points. Yeah. So Russell's answer is, properly speaking, proper names only refer to your current or recent sense data. Um, suppose you have a headache. Right? So you're pointing to your current headache, and you say, this is pulsing, or this is agonizing, or whatever it is. Yeah? You can have two different ways of referring. Well, 
could you, you could refer to your headache twice, but could, be, could it be informative to be told that it's the same headache? If you've got a pain in your foot, you say, is that pain the same, pain, the same as my headache? I don't know. Maybe that pain is it. Are you got a sensation of blue and um, a pain in your foot? And you say, is this sensation of blue the same thing as that pain in my foot? There isn't the possibility of informative identities with your own sense data. Or could you make sense of the idea, this headache, this headache doesn't really exist. That makes no sense. Right? If the term has meaning at all, I mean, if you currently don't have a headache, and you say, this headache, that, that, that's like blur, right? You haven't given the sign any meaning at all. Just saying this headache without a headache being there. So with signs referring to your own sense data, you can't have a meaning without reference. And with signs referring to your own sense data, you can't have informative identities. Yep. So are you saying that you can't have an informative identity by saying this headache is this headache? That's right. It's this same headache. It would be informative for your mom. But it, how would it be informative? But I can't, uh, I can't see it would be informative for you. I mean, it's an interesting case. I do, I do agree, actually. But I can't see how it would be informative for you. Because how could you be wondering, is this the same headache? But what if a doctor told you you're having a headache? And then you became informed that now you have some chronic headache. The doctor could tell you, well, the, the brain basis of the headache has been similar throughout. Yeah. But that is one and the same headache. How could anyone know better about that than you, about the experience itself, as opposed to its brain cause? Oh, things are hotting up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what if the doctor says it's not just a headache, you have cancer? Is that informative or something? It's not, no. <laughs> it's not just a headache, you have cancer. Yeah, that, that would be highly informative. But... Um, <laughs> It's not about the headache, right? That's, that's just giving you a completely gratuitous bombshell, you know, like, <laughs> did I ask? <laughs> I mean, you, know, you know you have something from your own senses, but you just don't know the meaning of it. Is that uh, doctor can you. Oh, you mean what's causing this pain is cancer? Right. Yeah. No, I think that's fine. I think the, 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 that's good. But the, I think that's not what Russell means here. He's just talking about the transitory experience itself, not its physical cause. See, so, so you and the, the previous question are, are, of course, completely right. You can get lots of information about the physical basis of the thing. But the sensation itself, that you know completely about. I mean, the thing about sensations is there's no more to them than the way they seem to you. So that's what I was saying about Scott here. Scott, I mean, that was a good example. You take something you can't. I mean, part of the reason it was a good example is um, it's hard to get two really different perspectives on the table, on the board, if you see what I mean. They're unlike most objects in that, that it's not quite so easy to cruise all around it. Um, um, but with a physical object, you can always have a different angle on it. With a pain, there's no more to the thing than the way it seems to you. You can't have different perspectives on one and the same pain that you're having. That makes no sense. The pain just is the presentation. But, you know, like people always say tomatoes, you know, like a tomato has a backside, right, as well as a front. If it didn't have the backside but just had the, the front surface, it would still look the same. Yeah? Pains are not like that. Pains don't have backsides, if you see what I mean. There's no such thing as going all the way around your pain and seeing that, Oh, well, there wasn't the bad part there that I thought there was. <laughs> you, you, you can't have different perspectives on a single sensation. A sensation just is the way things seem. Yeah. Uh, one, two. Visual experience is nothing more than visual experience itself, right? It would be equivalent to the object that you're seeing. That's right. That's right. That's what he's thinking. The visual experience is just the sensation. So, for instance, I started by saying, I'm looking at you right now. Yeah. My visual experience is not equivalent to you, but Ah, uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Forget about me. It's just the it's just the sensation you're having. Yeah. 
Yes. Air, yes, air is a good example, yeah. Right. That, that's right. But air, air is kind of a theoretical construct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the point there would be that you know about air only by description. So air is a kind of postulate that sometimes I can breathe easy, sometimes I can't. The reason for that is there's such a thing as air, and sometimes you get lots of it, and sometimes you don't get too much of it. Um, so you, it's descriptive, uh, is the idea. Yeah. It just kind of follows on from that. But is the philosopher saying that, that, that names can only be sense data? Can names can only refer to sense data. That's right. It does seem like in certain analytic situations, you would get a thing where they pick up names, like for example, what about mathematics, where I say, uh -huh. an unimportant, of unimportance or identity, you can see names in some of these situations where they are actually names, right? Like right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it does seem possible to have informative identities in maths too, though. Sure, but yeah. I agree. It's very difficult to know. Uh, uh, aren't these names in maths? Right. I, I think the, the 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 simple thing to say here is this is a different case. Yeah. That. Um, how you talk, thought and talk about the medium-sized world gets off the ground is going to be a very different story to how you talk, thought and talk about mathematics gets off the ground. Yeah? But you're right that there's the idea that um, 1, 2, 3, 4 are like the basic names of the numerals. Yeah? Um, whether that's true is, is, is not so obvious, but it's a very natural idea. 1, 2, 3, 4 are the basic names of the numerals. And then you can descriptions framed in terms of them, the square of 2 or whatever. Yeah. Yes. And then they, like, Very good. Okay, you, you guys have anticipated most of what I want to say in the rest of the classes. <laughs> so, well, exactly. You, you mean like the inverted spectrum? Yeah. So, how, how do you know what anyone else is meaning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, actually, let me. Uh, I just want to show you Russell talking about this because Russell is very deadpan about this. This is um, uh, uh, from the question session in a lecture Russell gave in this. If the proper name of a thing of this varies from instance to instance, how is it possible to make any argument? Right, your sense data keep coming and going. Um, Russell, you could, Mr. Russell, you can keep this going for about a minute or two. I made that dot in the blackboard, presumably, and talked about it for some little time. I mean, it varies often. If you argue quickly, you can get some little way before it's finished. <laughs> I, think, I think things last for a finite time, a matter of some seconds or minutes or whatever it may happen to be. Question, you do not think the air is acting on that, so you've got a smudge in the board, um, and changing it. Mr. Russell, it does not matter about that if it does not alter its appearance enough for you to have a different sense datum. So you can talk about the, your sense data just as long as they are there. right? It, hanging on to meaning is... You're always kind of on the run. OK. Um, so there's a contrast Russell makes. This is actually fully developed in the last article in the reader that we'll come back to at the end of term. But he draws a contrast between something like knowing about the tallest person in this room. I mean, I can tell you some stuff about the tallest person in the room. I can say the tallest person in this room is very likely over six feet tall. Yep. Um, very likely weighs more than 150 pounds. Yeah? Probably. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I can get some knowledge about that, or the center of mass of the solar system, right? But there's a more basic thing of knowing which person that is. That's a dis distinction between knowing about it by description and being acquainted with the thing. That's the kind of commonsensical thing. 
if I talk about the first headache I'm going to have in 2015, I can speculate about it. I can say, um, I bet it'll be one of those pulsing headaches I get. Um, uh, but then, if you say this headache is throbbing, the, meaning one you've got right now, this headache is unendurable, uh, that's a different thing. And Russell says, I'll say I'm acquainted with an object. Acquaintance is the ground of reference for Russell. Right? An acquaintance is when you've got a direct cognitive relation to that object, when you're directly aware of the object itself. Acquaintance is designed to emphasize the relational character of the fact with which we're concerned. So there's you and your sense datum, and you are acquainted with it, and because you're acquainted with it, you can pr introduce a sign, this or that, to talk about that sense datum. It's not itself a type of representation. Um, uh, when we ask what are the kinds of objects with which we're acquainted, the first and most obvious example is sense data. And Russell thinks, I'll, I'll skim over this, but Russell thinks you are also um, acquainted with the properties of your sense data. So they have kind of characteristics like being loud or being yellow or whatever. You can be directly acquainted with the color or a noise. Um, and you're also acquainted with things like yellow or... Uh, uh, noisy, so you can understand things like this is yellow. So um, among the objects with which we're acquainted are not included physical objects as opposed to sense data. The basic things we can refer to, the basic things we can name, don't include physical objects and they don't include other people's minds. So this is where you get this thing about the inverted spectrum uh, the, 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 that you were raising. These things, physical objects or other people's mind, you get them by knowledge, by description. That's to say, you say, I'm getting a lot of tableish sense data here. The cause of those tableish sense data, I'll call that the table. Or when you say Scott there, referring to the board, you thought that was a name, but Russell says, no, that's not a name. You're saying, I'm getting a lot of whiteboardish sense data here. I'll cause the cause, I'll call the cause of those white body sense data, Scott. And that's a description. Yeah? That's how come you could have meaning without the thing existing. Um, so um, the great strength of this approach is um, if meaning is grounded in your knowledge of your own sense data, then that really, there's something that Descartes really brought out. Most of you guys have come across Descartes and um, um, Maybe it's all a dream. Maybe it's all a dream. Dreaming skepticism, very good, yes, right. right. You know that, ki that kind of idea? Um, I mean, probably most of you thought about that before you even came to university, right? That's why you're in a philosophy class. But um, yeah, it, it might all be a dream. This, this might not be happening. Um, even if this was all a dream, your signs would all have the meanings that you think they do. Right? That was something that Descartes completely took for granted. Even if the physical world didn't exist, you, you would still be able to understand your language just the way you ordinarily do. And Russell's picture explains that. Your um, understanding of your ordinary language is grounded in your acquaintance with your own sense data. So you can hang on to meaning grounded in terms of your own sense data. Um, even if there isn't an external world, that seems very intuitive. And that's what Russell is thinking. But the downside of Russell's picture, you already pointed out, the downside of Russell's picture is that communication through language becomes impossible. Because when you talk, when you use English to talk about the world around you, your understanding um, of the signs you're using is grounded in your acquaintance with your own sense data. When I use English to talk about the world around me, my understanding of the signs I'm using is grounded in my knowledge of my own sense data. I don't have any direct acquaintance with your sense data. You don't have any direct acquaintance with my sense data. Um, whether we're using the signs in the same way is something we can never know. So Russell's picture has a lot going for it, right? And you see how, um, <coughs> how powerful the argument is for the position that he gets to. 
Because there are informative identities. Um, there is meaning without reference. And that requires that you be talking about descriptions. That's the only way you can make sense of it. Furthermore, there must be a class of names. But a class of names must be one for which there's no meaning without reference and no possibility of informative identities. That means that names must be sent names for sense data. But then, um, although we get this agreeable conclusion, it explains how you can hang on to meaning even through skeptical doubt. Um, we can't ever communicate. And on that bombshell, um, we'll pack it up for today and look at uh, Kripke on um, Friday. Okay.